morning's scripture reading is from Luke 5, 17 through 26. One day, Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Lord, we thank you that we have so many testaments. We thank you for the Gideons and for their support of putting Bibles out there all over the world. Lord, we thank you for the men and women who have decided to do this as part of their ministry, Father. And Lord, may we support them in our prayers and our um, acts of labor and Lord in our, our funds as well. Father, we thank you that you are the giver of all good things. We thank you that most of all that Jesus Christ came and, and said your sins are forgiven for those who believe because he was faithful to the end for his love for us, his compassion for us that he laid down his life to save the sheep. Father, open our eyes and ears to hear your word today, Lord, apply it to our hearts. Lord, may we be like Jesus in this world. May we be lights that shine forth in the darkness so that men see, see you and glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I entitled this the men's, the men's Faith, but I want to ask you this question first, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up to a lame man and walk? Did you think about that? I mean, what, which is easier to say? Sunday's devotion talked about Enjoying the riches of life. I hope you're reading along. I wanted to talk to you. All this week's devotions were really good devotions, not to say they're not normally, but they were really strong this week in my, my life. Enjoying the riches of life, it, not for our ultimate satisfaction, but instead for the satisfaction that God has intended. So He has been loving and kind to you. How should you be towards others? He has given you grace upon grace upon grace. What are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to be gracious to others? He has comforted you so that you can comfort others. So are you loving? Are you serving? What is it that the Bible says? Money is root of all evil. Not money is, is evil. What does it say? Oh, that is right. The love of money is the root of all evil. Have you thought about that? And what that means and grounded in and growing and how strong the root is to how strong it's growing in your life. And you know, it's hard to think that you love money, but James said that's the reason quarrels were among you, the brethren. It's because you don't have what you want. Does your Bible say that the love of money is the root of all evil or is the, root of the love of money the root of all kinds of evil? Maybe yours has the kinds in italics or, or something. Because it's not in the original script, but which way would you translate it? I mean, they're kind of the same, but yet they're totally different if you think about that. Because the love of money can't be the root of all evil, but it can be the root of all kinds of evil, right? 
So I thought about that, but it can be the root of all evil also because where does covetousness come from? Where does your desire to betray God come from? Because you want something that you don't have and everything. So either translation there is, is, this, is correct in my opinion. The King James Version says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. The New King James Version says all kinds of evil because we've put that in and implied it. But I, like I said, thinking about this week, I can see this and I can see this. But I never really looked at the love of money being the root of all evil. But yet when I get there and examine it and everything, I can agree with that statement as well. What do you think? Paul wrote to Timothy and said this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. This thought about money being the root of all evil or all kinds of evil. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a, tra and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of, take your pick, all evil or all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have even wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. They have departed from God because of their love of money and chased after the things of this world. So verse 17, he writes to Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may, hold, may take hold of the life that is truly life. Do you understand that? Are you living true life? Are you chasing after the things of this world? And in James chapter 4, which I alluded to earlier, verse 1 says, James writes, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Not within you, but among you. Because see, that love of money, of things, not only affects you, but it affects how you relate with others and the whole thing is about your relationship with God so that you can have the right relationship with others. Oh, through the cross of Jesus Christ. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. Wow. Love of money. <clears throat> When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what, what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, because of your love of money, you turn from God and have adulterous affairs with the things of this world. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scriptures say without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Now, you want to get into text variations, look at that scripture right there. Because <laughs> there's a lot of confusion in what that means. And I don't have the right answer. I, I will give you a, a childlike answer again that goes with scripture. Verse 6 then says, because, But he gives us more grace. Now, like I said, if you look at the different translations, there's a difference in what it talks about the Spirit and how it applies there. But just in a childlike manner, because God has given you His Holy Spirit, grace upon grace upon grace, amazing grace, why would He not long for me to live out my life by the Spirit rather than to live it out for the flesh? He longs for me to be in a right relationship with Him and be madly in love with Him, devoted to Him, giving Him his, his, the worship due Him in everything that we do. So you can look at that and translate it however you want to, but are you living a life that realizes the love that God has for you over the love of other things of this world so that this world has grown strangely dim and you live for God alone? Monday's devotion read this, started this way. Is God useful for your life or worthy of your life then? Boy, what did that say to you? At the end of the devotion, it mentioned Jesus cleansing the temple of sinners versus cleansing sinners 
so that they might live for God and His kingdom. Tuesday's devotion got you thinking about the fact that we would not have much of our New Testament except that Paul was imprisoned and how he viewed that by having everything taken away from him because he considered all the rest of the things of this world as rubbish or garbage. All he cared about was sharing the Word of God for living for God's glory, bringing Him honor, and telling others about Jesus Christ. So much of the New Testament you have today is because he had everything in this world that we find as riches stripped from him and he was in prison. And not only did he share the gospel message in the prison and write the letters that he wrote, but those people that came out of prison took that word across the world. Wow. When Satan thinks he's in control, but God is in complete sovereign control of everything, working out his will. Are you working praying that God's will be done and that His kingdom come? Are you praying for boldness to preach the gospel message? So we get to this paralyzed man. And we know that there's four men of faith if we study more and look at the other gospels. There's the Pharisees, the crowd, and then there's the reader of the story that's reading Luke's gospel. So this is your your different people that are in in this story. And you can look at them from different standpoints. You've got the paralyzed man who had, was, maybe had hope, maybe didn't have hope, but couldn't figure out how he could get to Jesus. And then you've got these four men of faith, let's call them that, that decided to do something for this man because they had a love for this man. They had compassion, whatever it was that, that drove them. They knew they were going to have to have trouble doing this. Uh, I don't know where they were, but let's say that Four men gathered together right here, and they had to tote this guy up to Safeway. That's a pretty big undertaking to begin with to say that you would do that. There wasn't the, the car, car or the horse and buggy that took him. They put him on a pallet and got him there, a mat got him there. They probably had to find wood or somehow to make a stretcher or something. And wait a minute, could they have done it with three? No. I mean, Maybe. Maybe with two or three you could drag him behind. But but all four participated in this and none of the four fell lacking a faith or the determination to do it. Then you have the Pharisees that came from all over the region to see who Jesus was but with a stone cold heart with closed ears. And then you have the crowd. What did the crowd want? The crowd gathered all around so much that, that, that they overwhelmed Jesus. But they wanted the kind of Savior that would take care of their needs, not a Lord that they would follow or a King that they would follow. And then you have the reader in this story that's reading Luke's Gospel, or if you're reading and studying along, and what is he saying to you by this point? So let's read this passage again. One day Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. Kind of sounds like the Great Commission, but a little differently. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. And that's a strange thing put in there. But remember, this is from Luke, the physician, and he's writing out this prescription for your heart, so to speak. And I'll I'll emphasize what that means a little bit to me later. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do, do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, asked, and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. Matthew's account says, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. Versus, Take heart, your sins are forgiven. Hmm. So if I have a heart that's right, I can be courageous and bold because the Spirit of God lives inside of me. 
Why do you harbor evil thoughts in your hearts versus why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Kind of like that love is the root of all, love of money is the root of all kinds of evil versus the love of money is the root of all evil. Do you have evil thoughts in your heart? Do you entertain them? Do you act upon them? In Mark's account, like I said, we learned that there's four men and the NIV says that they had to dig through the roof. They had to dig down through the roof, and I'll explain a little bit of that more later. But I'll ask you first, what is faith? These men had it. That's why I named these men the men of faith. What is faith? I mean, you can know the simple answer, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for, the assurance about what we don't see. Do you have that? Take yourself apart from this world and look spiritual. When you get cancer, when there's a death in your family, when there's whatever, when you've lost the funds, don't know where your house payment's coming from next, do you have faith? Do you have faith in the unseen things? Because if God loved you enough to send His one and only Son to die for you, and you know that a hair on your head won't be harmed, and you know that He works all things together for good to those that love Him, and there's nothing can separate you from the love that you have in Christ Jesus. Do you have that kind of faith? Now that is what the ancients were commended for, yes. We know that. And we have this hall of faith fame that I'm reading about in Hebrews 11. But verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him, the crowds came, the Pharisees came, the paralyzed man came, the four men of faith came. You're reading Luke's gospel, so you've come to Jesus. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Now there's the proof in the pudding, right? Do you earnestly seek Him? And that means leaving this world behind, denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following after Jesus. That your ministry is to share the gospel message, to live like Christ in this world, to be holy, set apart, for God's service, for His kingdom. James, to go back to what James said in James chapter 2, verse 14, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? And then he gives the example. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. And as you read on, James says this in verse 26, As the body without the spirit is dead. Wow. So faith without deeds is dead. So we're to this story about four men who decided to do something about a paralyzed man. We don't know why. They don't know if he was a brother akin to him or just a friend or if they just had compassion. Compassion because they saw a man that could not do anything to get himself to Jesus to be healed physically. Okay? But what was that question we asked? What's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? Everyone lives by faith. You do it every time you sit in one of those pews. You do it every time you get in your car. You live by faith that that chair is going to support you. You live by faith that that car is going to get you there. What happens when that chair falls? That doesn't happen as much. But what happens when that car doesn't get you there? All of a sudden, you've changed that attitude about faith, and you're all upset why you didn't get to where you're supposed to go when you wanted to get there. But it might have been because there was a man that needed you to bring him to Jesus. It took a lot of faith to know that Jesus could heal this man in the first place. It took a lot more faith to go through the trouble to fix that, to devise a plan to find three other men to go with you because they saw the need themselves and were willing to go through it and then take this upon themselves. They never intended to be met by the crowds necessarily or by the Pharisees blocking the door. Would you have undertaken it if you realized it was going to be that much trouble? Would you have done that or would it have been too much trouble? Or would you have even said, well, it might not have been in the Lord's will today. We'll try it another day. Isn't today the day of your salvation? 
How do you know you'll have tomorrow to bring this guy to Jesus? Are you becoming more and more like Jesus, fishing for men? Are you willing to go out into deep waters and cast the net down deep and take your friends, your fishers of men, with you? Because you know, as Gary said, that the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Will you be that person? Is Jesus making you into a fisher of men? So as we start in our story, one day Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. And I said last week the word Pharisee means set apart. They set themselves apart to be the religious guides, to be holy. And what they did was use that as a stumbling block for people. They were blind guides leading blind people. And they will both fall in a pit. And the pit is the pit of destruction for all eternity. Because they didn't understand, they didn't have a true relationship with God. They didn't love Him, they loved power, they loved money. Oh, wow. They took the Word of God and twisted it so that it would be a barrier for people to come to Jesus. But hey, I've set the rules up where I can do this. Wow. They showed no compassion, no mercy. They sat in the way, in their comfort, while someone was trying to bring a man to Jesus. They never got up. They never helped the band through the roof. They just sat there in their self-righteous indignation. I bet they were annoyed the roof was falling on their head. I guarantee you they were. <laughs> but you've got to sit there and say and examine from each part of the story, am I ever like that? They had come from every village of Galilee, from Judea and, Judea and Jerusalem. They had all come. They had taken time to get there and everything. Whether they would had in their heart just to, put, to point out that Jesus was a, 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 a flaw or whatever, fake, or what their purpose was. But their purpose sure wasn't compassionate and loving and kind, so they sure didn't understand God's amazing grace. Was the root of their problem, the love of money? <laughs> Did it produce evil in their heart or all kinds of evil? How could you ever get, call yourself set apart and holy and become that desperately lost? Then we get to those words, and the power of the Lord was, Jesus, was with Jesus to heal the sick. Okay, that does tell me that Jesus was a man relied upon the Spirit. He went to the, to the wilderness to pray and took times alone. He prayed to His Heavenly Father. He relied on the Spirit. He was a, he was a man, flesh and blood, that was, lived his life according to God's will and the power of the Spirit. Yes, but that's just strange that those words are there for that reason. Why would the power of the Lord be there to heal the sick? Oh, Jesus didn't perform many miracles in certain places because of their lack of faith. Oh, the Pharisees didn't have the faith. The crowds didn't necessarily have the faith. But there were four men that did. Four. Out of hundreds, maybe thousands, that said, let's put our faith into actions. Because faith without works or faith without deeds is dead. So the power of the Lord was there with Jesus to heal the sick, to perform this miracle. Why? To show that Jesus had power to forgive sins. He had spoken to demons before and cast them out. He had healed sick. He had even healed the leper who was a symbol of death, too far, somebody way too far gone. And Jesus said he was willing and now we see in Luke's story that Jesus is not only willing and able to forgive, I mean to heal sins because the power of the Lord is with him, but he also is equal with, he is God in the flesh. And then all of a sudden the next words written are some men, some four men. I think I'm proving my point a little bit more. The power of the Lord was with, oh, it's directly tied to these four men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house and lay him before Jesus. Did the crowds realize they were in the way? Did they look with wonder and amazement and 
they knew this man was paralyzed. They knew that somebody was trying to bring him to Jesus. They knew that point. That, what, did you just come here to not get to Jesus? And they kept their mouth shut and said, hey, no, we're not trying to get to Jesus. You know, they said, please, let us get to Jesus. It was their mission. If they went to this much trouble already, they weren't just stopping here and, and saying, oh, well, we just can't get there, which is obvious from the story. <clears throat> they were doing their best to get to Jesus, but there were crowds that stood in the way and Pharisees that stood in the way. The Pharisees would not move out of the way. They wanted to hear what was going on. They wanted to hear the sermon that day. Boy, but it didn't go in their deaf ears, did it? How many times do we see that out of the church or out of Christians? A little further when we were in James, we would read, Out of the same mouth, James 3.10, come praise and cursings. My brothers and sisters, this should not be so. How many times does a Christian not act like Christ? How many times is a church not the hands and feet of Jesus Christ? Can both fresh water and salt water flow, uh, flow from the same spring? Of course not. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. That's James 3.17 if you want to mark that so it helps you think about that each time you face a situation. The wisdom that comes from heaven is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. There were four guys committed to this purpose of bringing this man to Jesus who never in a million years thought Jesus would forgive this man of his sins for all eternity. That was not their game plan. Their game plan was just to get George, we'll use his name again just to do it, just to get George where he could walk again so he could enjoy the things of this world that we should all enjoy. They never dreamed that Jesus would forgive this man of his sins. Verse 19 of Luke chapter 5. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd. There's because. The crowd didn't move. They weren't to the Pharisees yet. They were just to the crowd. We want our fish and loaves or whatever we want. We want our healing. They went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Okay, how'd they get on the roof? They just happened to bring a ladder with them. Maybe there just happened to be steps. Maybe they had to climb the steps of the house on the other side and get him across to the roof of that house. Maybe they had to go to Home Depot. No, they couldn't do that. How did they devise a way? How did they get the man up on the roof? How much harder is that going to be to lift the man up on the roof? Well, they make a plan and they get him there. They're determined to bring this man to Jesus. They get on the roof. And like you said, they've got to dig through the roof. It's, it's got beams and then dirt. The roofs of that time were flat. That's why they you can yell it from the rooftops. You got up there and you yelled the message from the rooftops. It's an earthen roof that they had to dig down through probably about two foot deep. Where'd they get the shovel from again? Home Depot? Don't think so. So did they use their hands and fingers? They were determined to get there. Now, while all this is going on and the Pharisees are inside of the house, we're to the Pharisees, dirt falling down on them and stuff, you'd think at some point they'd say, well, let's help these guys, they're determined. Instead, by this point, they're probably saying, get off the roof, you idiots. We're trying to hear Jesus. Wow, do I hear Jesus? Love my enemies? Do I? Do I hear him deny myself and take up my cross and follow after him? Do I hear him say that I'll be known by the love that I have for one another? How many times do we sit there and not realize the black and white words that are there of Jesus that are cut and dry, however you want to look at it, because we're too caught up in our religious hypocrisy and our right standing with God based on who we are, what we've done. I don't know about you, but grace is amazing because it was for a wretch like me. <clears throat> they, 
They were tactical in what they did. They were going to get to Jesus and lay this man at the feet of one who could heal him. They didn't know they were laying him at the feet of the King of kings and Lord of lords. You know that. So how much greater should your faith be? And if you only have mustard size seed faith, it will grow as you allow the Lord to grow it till it becomes the biggest of the garden variety plants where birds can come and find shelter and rest. Verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith, the four men, he said to them, Friend, your sins are forgiven. How do you think they reacted to that? I'd be blown away. In fact, I'd kind of be mad. Why? Because I bought this guy for healing. It wouldn't even have dawned on me that time the bigger picture of the spiritual matter. It wouldn't have. I can be honest. I've determined I'm going to get this done and do that. I was not expecting this, but I, hopefully, yes, it would come, come right around and me realize that, wow, this is the ultimate purpose. But so many times I get myself fixated on the small things rather than the big picture and not know that this cancer came along or this death came along or whatever it is in the scheme of God's plans. That His ways are so much greater than mine. That's why, like I said, I'd have been... A little bit, what, Jesus, I brought him to... Oh, wait a minute. I get it now because I'll humble myself and ask for forgiveness. I wasn't expecting that big a miracle. But if we walk by faith, if Jesus said, if you have faith, what is it you can do? You can say to the mountain, be thrown into the sea. Again, I would never, ever, ever expect that. So I'm limiting the faith that I have. These men with faith brought this man to Jesus to be healed, and they heard instead, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Okay, we, know the, uh, we don't know what the crowd's thoughts were, but we know what the Pharisees' thoughts were. Blasphemy! Who can forgive sins except God alone? Jesus is making this statement that that is exactly who He is. Do you have the compassion, the love, the conviction, the faith, to rip off a roof to bring someone to Jesus? Or are you going to sit there more like the Pharisees and not even realize what's going on or even stand in the way? Or in their case, sit in the way. It's a good question to ask yourself. These four men were not paralyzed, but the Pharisees were paralyzed, weren't they? The crowds were paralyzed. Jesus saw their faith, whether they realized they were fishers of men or not. They took the man all the way to Safeway, dug the roof off of Safeway, lowered the man in, not worrying about, oh, wait a minute, the cops are probably here by now and going to arrest us for tearing the roof off of this house. But they said, ah, wait a minute, before you arrest us, we've got to get through and get this man to Jesus' feet. This is just such a huge act of loving kindness driven by compassion and faith in Jesus as a man who could heal, not as the Son of Man, the man-God who died for your sins for all eternity. And that's what you have to present to others. Wow. Do you have that love? Do you have that determination? Do you have a plan? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy, who can forgive sins but God alone? Do you realize who Jesus Christ is to you? Do you realize the need of the world? The real need of the world is not that this is healed or not that they're given daily bread. It's that they find rest for their souls. So yes, we need to meet the daily bread. We need to do the other things. That, that is a part of it. That's a part of our faith that we, that we don't live for the love of money, that we live for God's kingdom and for, for His glory and His will. And that's to bring people to Jesus because He's making us into fishers of men. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? 
Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? So I'm going to ask you that question now. You can say it out loud or not out loud. I don't care. Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? It's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Scripture says to say. It doesn't say to do. Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven. Because there's no proof that needs to be done. You don't know if that's true or not. It's a lot harder to say, be healed, and see that healing. Did you read Scripture that way? That's what it says. So Jesus took the physical again so you could see the spiritual because your minds are closed, your hearts are hard. They're focused on the things of this world, on love, whatever it may be. So it has to bring me to the altar, to the cross, to see that. Because if you examine that, there is some part of you that says, no, I didn't understand it that way, or I didn't think about it that way, because my mind is focused on worldly things. It's where I live, and I fix my eyes on that instead of fixing my eyes on Jesus and His kingdom. But He's telling these men exactly that, so that He can prove to them He is who He says He is by healing this man. Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say? And he's saying this to the Pharisees because he knew their heart. Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. In their heart they were saying, this man is not God. This is blasphemy. But I guess, and he's, Jesus traps them. <laughs> if I had to answer that question, I'd say it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because you don't have to have proof of that. But here you got us because you have the power to heal and the authority to heal. We already know that. But I want you to know, verse 24, that this, know that the Son of Man has authority to, on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, your mat, get up, take your mat, and go home. Wow. The sermon that was there, I don't know what Jesus was teaching about that day. I know the men had faith. I don't know what the crowds were there for, but I know the Pharisees came face to face sitting at the feet of Jesus with the King of kings and Lord of lords and had every opportunity to repent at this time of their self-righteous indignation because they knew only God Himself could forgive sins and Jesus proved it by healing the man of his paralysis. And this is where we're at in the story of Luke writing this. Immediately he stood up in front of them. He took what he had been lying home and he went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe. It's a word we beat down today because we are in awe of other things. But awe has to do with God and His glory and His divinity and who He is. And they said, we have seen remarkable things today. So where does that put us in the story? Well, you know what Luke writes next. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting in his tax booth, and he said, follow me. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men, Levi. Matthew, as we know him. Or you can sit there in the comfort of the chair you're sitting in, relying on faith that your chair is okay, relying on faith that your money will take care of you. You don't have any diseases you need to be cured of or anything that we know of but your sins do need to be forgiven. Will you accept Jesus Christ as the King of kings and Lord of lords? Will you accept Him as God in the flesh living among you, teaching you the ways of the kingdom? Will you get up and follow me? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you that Jesus humbled Himself, that He didn't have the things of this world that we find so enjoyable but yet at times entangling for us that he stayed on mission for you lord that he was prayerfully dependent that he that he was empowered by the spirit to do the will of the father not to just bring about temporary healing but to bring about physical i mean spiritual healing for all eternity by forgiving us of our sins by paying that sin debt once and for all so that we would be forgiven, so that we would be adopted children, 
and so that we would be given authority and power to be like Jesus in this world. Help us to not sit at the feet of Jesus and hinder people from coming to Jesus, but help us to be prayerfully, faithfully, tactfully involved in bringing people to Jesus, to be compassionate, not just for their needs in this world, but to be compassionate about their souls because we've been given healing, eternal healing that only comes through Jesus Christ. May we share what has been given to us so richly and so freely with others so that they can be a part of the kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.